Does the Fed print money? No, no, it doesn't. What it does do is create bank reserves. But aren't bank reserves money? No, no, they aren't. Bank reserves are not money. They aren't even relevant to the banking system. To understand why, we need to go back and trace their history, where they came from and how it came to be this way. And that leads us to two questions over the possible usefulness of bank reserves. We'll get into one of those today and we'll leave the other for a future discussion. And that's as a form of base money. People have this perception that bank reserves must be base money. Where does that perception come from? And why should it have been left in the past where bank reserves actually belong? That's what we'll talk about today. And the story of bank reserves and even the Federal Reserve itself begins in October and November 1907. Panic strikes the United States banking system. Panic that was becoming way too familiar. There had been one in 1893 with utterly devastating consequences. In response to the panic of 1907, a group of people got together to rescue a banking system just as it was hanging over the edge of the precipice. Most famously was, of course, Mr. J.P. Morgan, who cobbled together a princely sum of $25 million, which was really a huge sum back in those days. Some of it his own funds, some of it from other wealthy investors, those who were liquid at the time, and therefore got credit for saving the res rescuing the banking system, saving the country from a possible depression in 1908 that never happened. But it was more than just J.P. Morgan. In fact, the U.S. Treasury under Secretary Cortelyou, or Cortelyou, they came up with $36 million that they redeposited in New York City banks just in the nick of time. That was an even bigger rescue than J.P. Morgan's. But by far the largest rescue for the banking system was from the clearinghouse association sprinkled throughout the country. Altogether, according to Milton Friedman's calculations, there was the clearinghouse rescue totaled about $256 million, but that was not in cash, nor was it gold and specie. That was $256 million worth of something called clearinghouse loan certificates. And these are a quasi-money interbank form that allowed banks to exchange these certificates with other banks in the system, other banks in the clearinghouse, rather than having to withdraw funds, actual cash from their vaults. Put yourself in the position of a bank that is, that is under pressure from depositor runs and having a clearinghouse loan certificate or really having credit on the books of the clearinghouse allows you to pay any kind of liability to another bank in the system using that credit on the books of the clearinghouse, thereby leaving more cash in your vault to either use for meeting depositor withdrawals or better yet, to making, continue to making loans and doing all the things that banks, banks need to do. So clearinghouse loan certificates themselves were not a form of money, they were a form of interbank token or actually interbank credit that allowed the banking system to use more of the actual money in its vaults to meet either pressured needs or just regular payments. Essentially, it was a vault substitute and it proved to be effective. As I said, there was no depression in 1908, despite what was a pretty sharp recession and a pretty deep uh, liquidity and bank run in the fall of 1907. Government officials looked to that and said, we would like to have something like that in the United States. The U.S. had get, gotten rid of its first two central banks way back in the 1800s and had operated without one. However, the success of the clearinghouse model in 1907 convinced many politicians to do something similar, except instead of being a private bank clearinghouse association, or actually several sprinkled out throughout the country, why not have it all under the umbrella of a public utility? Now, of course, they didn't call it a central bank because Americans quite rightly distrusted them. Instead, they would call it the Federal Reserve. And the Federal Reserve's chief, chief instrument and tool would be bank reserves. The bank reserves were nothing more than the Fed's version of clearinghouse debt certificates, a, a limited use interbank token that banks could draw upon as a form of credit with the Federal Reserve banks, the various branches rather than clearinghouse associations sprinkled throughout the country. That's where the Federal Reserve came from, this desire to use clearinghouse loan certificates, but under a public utility umbrella. However, 
already by 1907 and going forward from there, the monetary and commercial system in the United States, indeed around the world, was already changing. The role and the importance of actual cash was diminishing. And if cash was going to diminish in importance, then what would be the use of an instrument whose purpose was to substitute for cash in a vault? I'll give you an example. A fellow by the name of David Kingley back in 1910 wrote, the contemporary share of checks and business-to-business transactions or wholesale trade was at 90%. And the success of the check payment system was all the more remarkable for its decentralization. Each bank was connected to the system only through correspondence of its own choosing. An interbank network, an interbank ledger that eliminated the use or the need to use hand-to-hand currency to settle transactions, between banks at least. You wouldn't need to use cash in your vault because you could settle on this correspondent network using check instruments. It would only grow from there. By 1941, the Federal Reserve itself said this about hand-to-hand currency. Currency, as the term is used in this section of its volume, includes coin and paper money issued by the government and by banks. It represents a relatively small part of the total money supply of the United States, as most money is held in the form of bank deposits and most money payments are made by check. And that's 1941. We're talking about the diminished use of hand-to-hand currency. So a tool of the Federal Reserve or Central Bank that's whole purpose is to substitute for currency in a vault when currency in a vault is becoming less and less of an issue means what is the point of reserves? Well, their purpose actually changed. In that same volume in 1941, the Fed said this, the aggregate amount of reserves of all member banks in relation to the aggregate reserve requirements or in relation to borrowings necessary to maintain reserves at the required level is a dominant factor in the trend toward credit expansion or contraction. So rather than being a form of base money, that is something that can be drawn upon to create infraction into loans and everything else that banks do, bank reserves became a way, primarily a way, for banks to meet imposed statutory requirements. And therefore, the Federal Reserve and even the government, I suppose, in theory, could therefore affect banks' behavior, essentially creating somewhat of a new role for them. Although this was, this was part of the original intent too, this was the only avenue in which to use bank reserves as a primary means to affect bank behavior. But even then, again, 1941, the Fed said, there are important differences in cost and liability and in attitude of the banks between reserves obtained at the bank's initiative by discounting paper and reserves obtained through open market operation by reserve banks, the inflow of gold from abroad, or other means outside the control of the member banks themselves. In other words, if, the, if banks are going to the Federal Reserve to discount paper as just a means of regular funding, which they could do, that was very different than, say, the Federal Reserve imposing open market operations as a means to influence bank behavior. That was more questionable. Instead, as the system continued to evolve away from currency and coin to more of a ledger system, it also evolved outside of that Federal Reserve required use of these reserves the Fed creates. As Milton Friedman said in 1969 of the Eurodollar system, the amount of cash being used by then, especially outside the United States, was negligible, which meant an entirely a ledger money system. And on that entire ledger money system, if there were no reserve requirements, what use would there be for the Fed's bank reserves? That is something the Federal Reserve was going to find out throughout the 1970s, especially in the early years of Paul Volcker. The myth goes that Paul Volcker made reserves expensive, thereby taming the banking system somehow and and crashing the great inflation, ending the great inflation once and for all. That was the idea the Fed was going to use this reserve requirement power to manipulate bank behavior. In fact, in July of 1981, Federal Reserve officials had this very discussion because it didn't seem to be working. As Mr. Roos said, Paul, talking to Paul Volcker, isn't our purpose, though, to impose the discipline of monetary policy upon the banks? That was the idea. 
And won't the fact that they had to pay more teach them a lesson? Won't it teach them that if we want to discourage their extending credit, for example, that they have to take seriously and not anticipate that we'll be there with the funds they need for their reserve requirements when they need them? Again, the idea is if banks are making too much credit, banks are creating too much of this ledger bank money, then the way to restrict that creation of money to tame inflation in the economy would be to make the reserve requirement more expensive to be met. In other words, if you make the bank reserves more expensive, it makes creating credit more expensive. Therefore, banks won't do it. That was the theory. As Ruse continued, I thought our strategy essentially was to attempt to bring down inflation by controlling the availability of bank credit. And I think the banks have been accustomed in the past to assure, assuming that when Wednesday came around, somehow or other the Fed would supply the necessary reserves in order to resist the otherwise upward mov movement of the Fed funds rate. Now by letting the Fed funds rate flow upward, even though it's more expensive to them, we will discourage the provision of credit. Or am I mixed up? As Ruse would find out, he was indeed mixed up. That didn't work. In other words, making bank reserves more credit, meaning making the reserve requirement more expensive to meet, did not, in fact, tame money creation or credit creation at the banks. The one tool the Federal Reserve had in order to try to influence bank, bank behavior all depended upon the meaning of reserve requirements. But already by the late 1970s, the banking system had already found a number of ways to circumvent it, including the euro dollar. Why pay for a reserve requiring them? It gets increasingly expensive when I can shift funds offshore where there is none. Or if you want to keep funds onshore, shift customer deposits that would be subject to reserve requirements to something like a non-bank money market fund. Any number of innovations so that when you create a loan, which then creates a deposit liability, which is then subjected to a reserve requirement, you weren't stuck paying the higher reserve, higher costs associated with a reserve requirement. You could then manage your liabilities so that you don't have to be subjected to the Federal Reserve's reserve policies or the government's. Banks had taken control over money creation and credit creation sidelining the Fed. And since there was no more really hand-to-hand -hand cash, what, what role was there for bank reserves? As Alan Greenspan admitted, at least in private, in March of 1991, I must say I'm quite reluctant to cave in, if you will, on this question that we can do nothing but target the federal funds rate. Well, Alan, you did cave in because that was absolutely true. Once bank reserves were sidelined, what did the Fed actually have left? This issue arises largely because what we are doing de facto is targeting the funds rate. I'm not sure that any of us believes that that's the right policy. And then as Meltzer replied, as a practical matter, we are on a Fed funds targeting regime now. We have chosen not to say that to the world. I think it's bad public relations, basically, to say that that is what we are doing. And I think it's right not to. But internally, we all recognize that that's what we are doing. Listen to what they're saying here. The Fed does not print money. The Fed's bank reserves, which used to have a historical use, no longer does. All they can do is target a federal funds rate. And what did they do to target a federal funds rate? They might supply some reserves or take them away in order to meet the federal funds target. But as you'll notice on the chart here, there were no reserves because demand for reserves had essentially disappeared. While money and credit creations continued in substantial form throughout the 80s, 90s, and into the 2000s, the level of bank reserves essentially dwindled, especially as a proportion and percentage of the overall system. There was no use for them. And the Fed knew it. The only way the Fed could possibly affect the banking system, therefore the economy, was to move the federal funds rate around and just hope that it all worked out somehow. As Greenspan and Meltzer were admitting in 1991, and they would continue to admit it to 19, throughout the 1990s, if you actually listen to what they say, they don't do money anymore. And bank reserves were no longer part of the monetary system, not a big part or even much more than an inconsequential rounding error. That's not to say that there aren't 
uses for bank reserves. And we'll get into those in a, in a later video. We'll talk about things like bailing out individual institutions. You can use bank reserves to do, to do exactly that, just as we saw last year during the banking crisis with the BTFP. But is that the same thing as printing money? Or does this additional use case lead to a whole different set of meanings and questions and interpretations? That's what we'll get into later. But to recap what we learned here today, Bank reserves started out as a way to recreate the functions of clearinghouse debt certificates. These internal interbank tokens whose use was tied to being a substitute for cash. But as cash and currency withdrew from the economy in any meaningful way, we moved to strictly a ledger system, bank reserves were then only useful in the means of meeting a reserve requirement. But as the system continued to evolve further to get around reserve requirements, that left bank reserves as basically meaningless or near meaningless. That's why bank reserves essentially dwindled to basically nothing for decades. While the, while the global system continued to expand exponentially, bank reserves actually declined and stayed close to zero for decades. Bank reserves are not base money. They are an artifact of an age long gone by. The question we therefore have to ask ourselves is can the Fed resurrect them in some fashion to make them more meaningful and useful in a 21st century context? Well, the 2008 experience as well as the many years afterwards suggests that the Fed has not figured it out, at least in this broad money creation sense. Again, there's questions about whether or not they have usefulness in an individual bank sense, but as far as the system goes and money printing, the last 15 years have conclusively proven bank reserves are not money. They don't have a place in the banking system, and ultimately, that's what actually matters. But as the euro dollar system arose, it allowed banks to experiment with various different ways to do the same thing that bank reserves might have done in a long time ago. And that is essentially liquidity became bank exclusive and central banks were not invited. As we saw in 2011, for example, Stunned Federal Reserve policymakers were talking about another massive global dollar problem at the same time they had created $1.6 trillion in bank reserves. We've got a bank crisis and liquidity crisis, dollar shortage worldwide, and suddenly $1.6 trillion in bank reserves. In other words, there was no difference between after the second QE and $1.6 trillion bank reserves, the period before 2008, when there were practically none. The results were exactly the same. Because what matters, what ultimately happened here, is banks took control of money. Especially true as the economy uses less and less hand-to-hand -hand currency, which is government currency. It's a bank money system. And by the 60s and 70s, as Paul Volcker would learn in the 70s and 80s, a bank money system is exactly that, for good and for worse. Believe it or not, the Chinese are going through something very similar where they're finding out maybe bank reserves aren't all they're cracked up to be or what people believe about them. I talked about that just recently and that's a video linked below. As always, I thank you very much for joining me. Huge thank you, Eurodollar University members, some of whom you see over here, and Eurodollar University subscribers. Until next time, take care.